Okay, so today what I want to talk about for case study is um, a patient that I worked with with medial elbow pain. Um, as I like to mention in all these case studies, uh, the details have been adapted, so this isn't reflected exactly of the patient that I worked with um, to protect anonymity and also um, because it's a little more interesting when you can give a little bit creative freedom. And so it's a combination of um, patients that I've worked with and a little bit of clinical decision making. So um, the other thing I always want to give a chance for is, uh, whoops, sorry about that. Trying to, there we go. So the other thing I want to give a chance for is um, to access these resources. So posted a template that goes through some clinical reasoning process that I really like to go through as you're learning a physical therapy evaluation um, and components of the evaluation, kind of what they're, what they're teaching you and what different aspects of your exam you can use for different types of evidence. I really feel like this template is pretty helpful as you're trying to learn how to reason, what tests you might include, what tests you might exclude, and then just the basic components of your exam. So there are links to these within that PowerPoint. And then as you're going through a patient evaluation or even working through the case study, this blank template on the right, you can also use to um, enhance your reasoning and kind of quiz yourself or test yourself. What, what evidence or what information are you getting from each of these pieces of your exam? So those are resources for you all if you'd like to use them. <clears throat> so the case study I want to talk about today is um, uh, patient I saw Jake, Jake, fake name, is a 54-year-old male, um, presents to physical therapy with complaints of right medial elbow pain. Um, so demographic information, what do we have to start off with? 54-year-old male uh, having pain in the elbow, what are we starting to think about as far as differential diagnoses? So common sources of elbow pain could be um, tendinopathy, could be referral from the cervical spine, it could be uh, a ligamentous injury. Often we'll see UCL injury depending on the age, gender, activity level. Um, could be something like a fracture if there's a traumatic mechanism. So all things that we're starting to think about as we get this just primary complaint, pain localized to the elbow. So these are all things that we're <clears throat> gonna wanna ask about or narrow down. So what questions would you like to ask Jake as part of your uh, physical therapy subjective exam? What are important things to you? Some of the things that I was thinking about were what was the mechanism, onset, what were the pain qualities? Uh, those, those sorts of things can help us start to narrow down and hone in on what are the pain generators, what are the tissues of interest, and try to help us come up with a plausible and reasonable physical therapy diagnosis, but also maybe give us a sense for what a medical diagnosis might be, because that might guide our treatment, even if we're not making that diagnosis as a physical therapist. <clears throat> so through my subjective questioning, here are the things that I kind of teased out is the onset of this medial elbow pain. It started two or three months ago. Um, this individual first noticed it during a tennis match and it progressively kind of got worse. Um, he was an accountant, he noticed it during computer work. So he was typing, when he was using a mouse, those sorts of things were aggravating to this elbow pain. Um, so no trauma involved, so that's kind of important. That makes us think less likely for fracture, more likely for a chronic overuse, repetitive overuse mechanism or injury. Um, pain was located to the medial elbow and is described as achy, sharp if he was really um, hitting a forehand or, or gripping forcefully, described it as sharp. Pain fluctuated, so at best it would go away. Uh, there were things that eased the pain. Um, resting, avoiding those gripping activities, avoiding weightlifting. He liked to weightlift, but he was unable to currently. Um, he was taking an over-the-counter and NSAIDs, I believe an ibuprofen, icing. Those things helped a little bit, but didn't completely um, resolve his symptoms. And when, he was, when the pain was really aggravated, it got up to an eight out of 10. So if we're thinking about severity or irritability of symptoms, that's something that we would 
want to keep in mind is that at its worst, the pain was pretty significant. Um, and he was having pain every day. It was intermittent. It was worse in the morning. It was worse at the end of the day, worse after these aggravating activities. So he couldn't completely stop typing or using the mouse for work. And so those sorts of things, um, engaging in those aggravated his elbow pain. He had quit weightlifting, but he couldn't, he couldn't cease his work activities. Um, some other things that are, that were key that I picked up on, uh, he didn't report any ridiculous symptoms per se. So he denied numbness and tingling. He denied radiating pain, shooting down into the fingers um, or up the arm. However, he did have some past medical history that was interesting and maybe necessitated a further look. So hypertensive, mildly overweight, former smoker. So those things are contributing to overall maybe a lower level of health. But the things that I really want to key on on are this history of chronic neck pain. So anytime somebody has upper extremity pain with concurrent neck pain, we always want to rule out or we always want to dig into the possibility that there is some sort of radicular pattern or there is some sort of um, nerve root or neck contributor to that upper, extem upper extremity pain or symptoms, even if the patient themselves do not make that connection or it's not immediately obvious we still want to rule out that possibility also had a right rotator cuff repair surgery and so that's gonna potentially affect our treatment if we're treating the right elbow um there's a potential source for maybe this elbow pain is if his um, mechanics have changed because of that injury and rehabilitation so again that's something that we want to look at that's an important piece of his medical history uh, his referral source was an orthopedist he didn't have imaging performed no traumatic MOI, so we're not particularly concerned that he doesn't have imaging, but it's interesting to note, especially if he doesn't respond to treatment. Um, if we suspect a fracture, we would like to clear that. If we suspect a soft tissue injury that's not responding to physical therapy, then maybe another source of imaging uh, would be appropriate. So maybe an MRI would be appropriate at some point, um, probably not immediately. And his goals are to return to pain-free tennis, work activities. He wanted to get back to weightlifting. So that's what we got out of the subjective. So again, I want to reiterate some of the important subjective exam findings as we have this P1 or source of pain, source of the patient's main complaint, which is at the elbow. We also have this P2. We also have a, a pain location that wasn't initially present within his main complaint, but that we figured out in his subjective questioning, his history checking, and that's the neck pain. So I want to keep that in mind as we're going through some of his objective testing to try to rule in, rule out source of the elbow pain. Um, so at this point in the exam, after going through taking the patient history, taking a good subjective, what are your physical therapy or medical diagnoses? What are you honing in on? Is there anything that would make you think that maybe a red flag would be present or a referral would be necessary. So things like fracture, things like ligamentous injury or instability that would necessitate further Im imaging um, or potential referral for treatment that maybe is outside of physical therapy, so surgical intervention. Um, I didn't really think so at this point, given that there was no trauma, um, and there were no complaints that would lead me to believe there was instability at that joint or ligamentous compromise. Um, however, our objective testing is going to give us a better sense for that. Um, and it seemed, based on his subjective, that his pain was pretty mechanical or pretty true to what we would think of as musculoskeletal pain. So it didn't really crop up with any of these red flags um, where his pain wasn't responding to positions or forces like we would expect from musculoskeletal pain. So um, those are things to maybe keep in mind as we go through the objective testing, but I didn't have anything stand out to me within the subjective that would really clue me into that. And then as we're going into our objective, we always want to be thinking, what are the tests and measures that we would like to perform as part of our objective exam? So what are the key things that we want to test for? Well, it's having pain at the elbow, so we definitely want to test um, muscles that attach in and around the elbow. 
um, you want to palpate and check out bony prominences around the elbow that have condyles, olecranon. We also want to look at other soft tissue areas that could be contributing, so tendons, ligaments, things like that. Um, and we're going to go through each step of our objective exam um, to be really comprehensive. So looking at active range of motion, passive range, um, our special testing, all these things are going to give us different pieces of information based on that um, algorithm or the process of going through our clinical exam and the different information that we gain from each as indicated on that, the um, clinical research document in the beginning. Um, okay, I'm gonna one more person into this here. Okay, so one second here. All right, so moving into our objective findings. Within objective testing, didn't observe anything significant at the elbow, so no bruising, no edema was really present. Uh, functional testing, his grip strength notably was decreased on the right side. Not uncommon for elbow um, uh, muscle or tendon issues at the lateral or medial elbow. Um, his screens, uh, his neck motion was a little bit limited, but didn't seem to reproduce his, his elbow pain, so that's significant. Uh, his neuro exam, the positives on that neuro exam were a right median upper limb tension test that was positive, but everything else kind of checked out from a neuro standpoint. So Spurlius test was negative, distraction test was negative, he didn't really have any other positives in his upper limb tension testing. So we're thinking less likely for radiculopathy, but we'll, we'll revisit that in a second. And then his active and passive range of motion, he's a little bit lacking in um, wrist extension, a little bit lacking in supination. Um, nothing super significant, but it is notable that supination is a little bit lacking on the right. And we'll see why that might come into play in a second here. Um, he does have pain as well with overpressure of end range supination on the right. And one thing you might be starting to recognize or starting to think about is what could be the limiter or what could we be putting tension on as we bring him into end range supination? So is it a joint restriction? And we know that pronation and supination are their main contribution or their main source of motion from a joint standpoint is that radial ulnar joint or both radial ulnar joints both proximal and distal radial ulnar joints tend to give us um, forearm pronation and supination ranges of motion. But we also have muscle tendinous contributions to those motions. And specifically, um, the pronator muscles are gonna limit supination if they're tight or painful. And the supinator muscle, muscles, muscle groups, supinator, um, biceps brachii could also be contributing as a supinator. If those muscles are tight or painful, they could restrict pronation. So again, a couple sources could be present for that finding. Um, our MMTs most significantly is that we have some pain with uh, wrist, wrist flexion, we have some pain with, with pronation. So again, thinking about what muscle groups are affected, where's the source of his pain, that medial elbow, specifically he's tender at the right medial epicondyle, and that's where our common flexor tendon inserts. So we're starting to come up with a pattern that's um, commonly seen, and that is for a medial epicondylalgia or a golfer's elbow. In fact, he has a positive golfer's elbow test, which is putting stretch on those muscles and tendons. So bringing patient passively into full wrist extension and Supination is going to stretch those muscles, and that is the golfer's elbow test, is that stretch. Um, again, it's important to note, and we maybe want to think about this positive upper limb tension test um, as we're going through some of our treatments and a little bit more into our differentials. So don't forget your anatomy. Uh, as I mentioned, this medial epicondyle is a source of the common flexor tendon. And as I'm demonstrating here with my fingers, I really like this visual because it's a nice way to describe the superficial layer 
of muscles that attach to this common flexor tendon. So um, my thumb in the picture is demonstrating one muscle, my index finger, third digit, fourth digit. So those four fingers, my pinky's kind of curled around and that doesn't count, but those four fingers are gonna give you a really nice visual for these, the direction, uh, the line that these tendons run and the muscles that they attach to. So just a little reminder that the muscles that we're talking about are going from, again, my, my mnemonic or my cheat on my fingers is, my thumb is representing the pronator teres, and then moving along, we have flexor carpi radialis, palmaris longus, flexor carpi ulnaris, all attaching to that medial epicondyle. So those are all contributors to this common flexor tendon that could be involved in this pathology. So top PT diagnosis at this point in the exam, we're thinking uh, radiculopathy from the neck is less, less likely. It really tends to fit this, our subjective and objective findings are really pointing us towards uh, more of a epicondylalgia type presentation. However, we do want to be thinking about the neck. And so uh, because of that, I included in here to remind us our treatment-based classification system for neck pain, uh, where we have these four classes that we tend to put patients into based on how we, we group their clinical signs and symptoms, but also based on how we expect them to respond to these different treatments. So if we describe these four classes, um, what we're gonna find is neck pain with radiculopathy, those sorts of patients respond to treatments that are specific to that presentation. Neck pain with headache, neck pain with movement coordination impairments, and neck pain with mobility deficits. So those are four options. If somebody has neck pain, if possible, we want to try to classify them because that's going to help guide our treatment and that's going to help treat, help us treat them in physical therapy in the most efficacious way um, if we kind of group them within these clusters instead of treating them as just a homogenous group of somebody with neck pain. It can really help guide us into maybe a more effective treatment. So is our patient... Uh, with elbow pain and then a secondary complaint of neck pain, do they fit into this cervical radiculopathy category? Because they do have um, an upper extremity source of pain, that medial elbow. They also have neck pain. So do they really fit into this radiculopathy model? Well, in some ways they do. They do have the, the key to this radiculopathy is that you do have some sort of upper extremity pain. However, let's look at the, our clinical practice guideline or, or our um, clinical prediction rule um, demonstrated by Weiner and his research where he described a four test cluster to rule in um, radiculopathy. And in fact, if individuals or patients have three out of four of these tests positive or four out of four of these tests positive. And I put these um, numbers in the notes, but the, the likelihood that they have, in fact, a cervical radiculopathy is quite high. So it's upwards of 90%. So three, again, three or four out of these four tests are positive. It's very likely to have cervical, cervical radiculopathy. So how does our patient stack up? Well, if we remember, the four tests that belong to this cluster. One of them is a decrease in rotation of 60 degrees. Second one is a positive spring lace A test, neck, positive neck distraction test, and finally a positive upper limb tension test for median nerve. And a quick tip to remember these, how I try to remember them is shake your head no, push them, pull them, stretch them. In other words, shake your head no is testing that rotation, Push them is applying some pressure in a spurling's position. Pull them is a distraction test, and stretch them is my way of remembering the upper limb tension test for median nerve. And does this really apply to our patient? It turns out it doesn't really so much. So if we look back at our objective findings really quick, well, we'll see that uh, the only thing, the only test that really ends up positive for our patient is this right upper limb tension test for median nerve. So one out of four tests positive on this Wehner cluster for cervical radiculopathy doesn't make it very likely for us 
to assign that as a diagnosis for our patient. So it's good to go through that algorithm, but in this particular case, I do not think I did not think that his the source of his symptoms was necessarily a radiculopathy. So again, here's what we came in with: 54 year old male accountant, right medial elbow pain, and based on the presentation, so the subjective and objective information, what was what is your decision as far as treating this patient, referring this patient? Would you like to treat and refer? So my decision making in this particular case was as I've kind of talked through, diagnosing, um, giving PT diagnosis as right medial epicondylalgia, that would be the medical diagnosis actually, um, but the PT diagnosis would be elbow pain, so right elbow pain, um, and then as well as the concurrent diagnosis of cervicalgia or neck pain, and my clinical decision was to treat. So this seemed like a musculoskeletal issue, something within physical therapist's wheelhouse, and so I decided to treat. Uh, thinking about next, the PT plan of care and treatment. So I was thinking about these different factors to guide my physical therapy plan of care. Prognostic factors, type of tissue involved, and stage of healing. For a, whoop, so for a um, tendinopathy type presentation, um, the negative prognostic factors were um, the fact that this individual was not necessarily the healthiest individual. So if we remember hypertensive, overweight, former smoker, so those things don't really promote quick healing. So that might lead to a longer physical therapy plan of care. The other thing that might lead to a little bit longer physical therapy plan of care is the fact that we have what we think is a tendinopathy issue. And so in the notes, what you'll see is a reference to a study by Murphy where they looked at tendinopathy healing and response to treatment. And even though it was in the lower extremity, I think some of this research can be extrapolated to tendinopathies in the upper extremity. We really see that uh, when, when we have these chronic tendon issues, they do tend to respond to physical therapy, but it takes a while. And it could take nine to 12 weeks to see really peak improvements in these tissues. So um, that's gonna contribute to a little bit longer plan of care or estimate of care needed for this patient, according to what I was thinking. Stage of healing, again, this is not necessarily an acute issue. We didn't have an acute mechanism of injury, but it's more of a chronic repetitive overuse. So it took some time to develop. And it's also gonna take some time to respond to treatment. So those are the things I was thinking about as I recommended that we work with this patient two times a week for eight weeks. And eight weeks might be even a little bit on the short term, but that was what I came up with. So an outpatient orthopedics, a, a pretty standard physical therapy plan of care, um, tends to be six to eight weeks of treatment for non-surgical patients. And so I went with a little bit longer for this individual, thinking that their symptoms might not be completely resolved within eight weeks, but I was hoping I could get this individual who's pretty motivated, really smart, even though not all of his lifestyle factors were on point, at least he had a history of being active with tennis, with weightlifting. So I, I felt pretty confident that if we could help him through some of his early treatments and really get him to see progress, that we could ideally transition him to more of a home management or independent management program where he was continuing to do exercises on his own, but maybe not attending physical therapy. So the goal was to discharge him with a home exercise program within eight weeks, not that he was going to be completely cured within eight weeks or have a full resolution of symptoms. So. Physical therapy treatments that I started out with, um, similar to other tendinopathy issues, I started out with some um, eccentrics for those wrist flexors and uh, as well as um, pronator muscles. So I started out with Therabar eccentrics, um, some wrist flexion curls, worked with some upper kinetic upper extremity kinetic chain work. So remembering that he had that prior rotator cuff issue, he did demonstrate some weakness in his scapular control and rotator cuff muscles. And so uh, we worked a little bit on that. We wanted to work on grip strength as well. 
although he had painful grip and some weakness there coming in with, uh, the pain really had me hold off in the short term on training grip, but that's something that we got to later in the treatment. And then a little bit of manual therapy as well at the elbow, just try to modulate pain and um, encourage blood flow at the tendon. And then also did some nerve gliding at the, at the uh, neck and shoulder. So with a positive median nerve upper limb tension test, we wanted to resolve that impairment, even if it wasn't the main course, main source of symptoms, still wanted to treat that that finding. But really the key thing was treating the tendinopathy that we found. And so a couple things I wanted to know quickly, some, some uh, treatment guidance that I took from other tendinopathy research from the lower extremities were to really utilize this pain monitoring model from Silvernagel and keep his pain below a four out of 10. So with tendinopathies, we don't necessarily think that we can work in a completely pain-free range, but we do want to work below a pain threshold to try to avoid provoking further irritation. The other thing that we want to do is be very diligent about progressing load in an intelligent way. So we don't want to just throw any kind of load at these individuals. We really want to progress them from a low load at slow speed to a higher load at slow speed, and lastly, introduce a higher speed loading. And that we know tends to really promote tendon remodeling and tendon healing in the best way um, and avoid provoking undue irritation or flare-ups for these particular individuals. So that was, those were some of the things that kind of guided my treatment through this case. Here are some references for you all if you want to piece through. So some having to do with the cervical um, issues that we talked about, but a lot of them having to do with the tendinopathy prescriptions. All right. So thank you all for bearing with me on that case study.